Hello, everybody. Uh, Salaamu Alaikum. Peace and blessings to everyone. Uh, I'm really honored to have with us a three-term member of the U United States Congress, uh, Dean Phillips, who is a candidate for president and actually is talking to us from New Hampshire today. Uh, as you see, his campaign is about relieve, repair, reimagine. Um, and so I really appreciate the time you're taking to, to spend with us, uh, Congressman. As salam thank you. Salam Aleichem to everybody. And I just want to start by letting you know that I come to this with an open heart, uh, an open mind, uh, and an overarching uh, belief uh, that all of us can and must and will join hands and put humanity first and end this cycle of bloodshed between people who should be brothers and sisters. And that's one of my overarching missions in running for president is to recognize that truth, uh, to listen and to learn, not project. And most of all, be a peacemaker, uh, working with you, working with you. And that's why I'm grateful. And I hope we could start by perhaps me listening uh, to you as you share uh, the pain of the Muslim community right now, both at home and overseas. Well, well, thank you. And, um, you know, you come from a great state of Minnesota uh, that gave our country Hubert Humphrey, mm -hmm. one of the greatest lawmakers uh, of our land and um, unfortunately, he ran when our our country was going through uh, a very difficult time in addressing the war in Vietnam. Right. And in similar ways, we're going through um, division in our society due to what's happening in, in Gaza right. uh, and Israel uh, and throughout the Palestinian territories. And unfortunately, uh, something that's widening uh, to the region. Um, you also uh, have from your state uh, a great senator who passed away due to an airplane crash, Paul Wellstone, who was actually a very good personal friend of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. He was one of the first sponsors uh, of our forums and our papers that we presented to the U.S. Congress. He felt that there needed to be a Muslim voice. So he was there as well. And also Walter Mondale, we can't forget him and the great work that that he did. Minnesota has always produced, uh, to me, people, leaders that were at the cutting edge of what our society should be. Exactly what you said, moving away from tribalism and speaking to our common humanity. And, uh, and it produced also one of our great uh, legislators, who's now your state attorney general, Keith mm -hmm. Ellison. And uh, he was the first, I believe, uh, one of the first, if not the first, uh, attorney generals to actually hold our police accountable to make our police more effective, not to use these tactics that target and, and kill uh, many of our African-American uh, brothers and, and even some sisters. Um, so we produced uh, a lot of great leaders from Minnesota, and I, I see that you're coming from that uh, you're, you're cut from the same cloth, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we really appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you. Uh, what what our our community is facing, I think it's it's on two fronts. We have seen too often that the United States government, our government, um, and coming from the White House, whether it's Republican or Democrat, really, um, using only military means to create change, and every time. There was a military, only a military, and, and, and President Biden even said that in his um, foreign policy and national security paper, is that the Biden administration wants to move away from a military-centric approach to the Middle East to a human-centric approach, which is what we believe in, is that we need human security to augment uh, national security. Human security established by Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the four freedoms, freedom of worship, freedom of expression, freedom from fear, which speaks to what Muslims throughout the world are facing, either they're under occupation or under tyranny or now subject to uh, a possible genocide uh, in Gaza. Uh, and so we see the military approach is the only option there. And then what happens is you support dictators to support that policy, or there's a resistance that grows out of it that turns into terrorism, and then we're only focusing on the symptom, which is terrorism, and not the cause, which is much of our policies, and 
the lack of connection with the people of the region. So we see a need for people-to-people -people diplomacy. My wife and many of our friends, um, their extended family have actually lost members. Uh, 60 from my wife's extended family from Gaza, they, they live in Khan Yunus, they've all been killed. Uh, and so um, we continue to see the pain and suffering. Then the second front is here in America where we're just as much opposed to, uh, to uh, anti-Semitism as anyone else. We want to work with our government and with the Jewish community and with partners in the civil rights community to, to oppose anti-Semitism. But sometimes we see anti-Semitism weaponized to actually create uh, anti-Muslim animus that suppresses the, the speech of our community in speaking uh, about what we believe uh, should be the answers, which to us, a ceasefire followed by serious political negotiations, because it, eventually that's where we're going to lead to, you know, where we will need to, to achieve a ceasefire um, so that we can get people to the table. And, and that way, you know, when Netanyahu says we want everything from the river to the sea, and then P Palestinians say Palestine should be free from the river to the sea. Okay, well, let's let's get at least to the table to start talking about how we can achieve the rights, as you said, of all the Abrahamic members uh, of the faith. The last thing I want to say is that we need uh, not just one narrative of what's happening in the Middle East, but at least a dual narrative the Palestinian narrative as well as the uh, Israeli narrative. Um, and the Palestinian narrative encompasses 1300 years where Jews were supported and protected uh, in Jerusalem um, uh, up until the 19th century, from the eighth century all the way to the 19th century. Um, and, and Christians were, were protected um, uh, by the Muslim rulers at that time. That's the narrative that we feel is 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 missing and and not understood by our fellow Americans. Anyway, I've I've spoken too much, um, not at all. And we'd love to hear your, your thoughts and reflections on where we can go from here. And we've seen, you know, we've read your statements in terms of of, of moving towards um, uh, negotiations and eliminating terrorism from the region, which we agree with a hundred percent. We we want to see terrorism as obsolete. That is not an option for change. But in order for that to happen, we need to create nonviolent means of creating change. Salam, thank you. And and I, I wish more to just take moments like this to open ears and, and hearts and listen. And the more we did, would do that, I think the world would be in a better place. You know, I, I'm struck as you speak to about the use of military might rather than olive branches. And uh, I'm not sure if anybody knows, but I lost my father in the Vietnam War, mm. uh, a young Jewish soldier serving his country uh, who went to Vietnam because he had, had to earn an ROTC scholarship because he could not afford college. And I believe had he lived, he would have been an investor in peace. Um, and I'm taking that torch from him in that spirit uh, of reconciliation, shared humanity, uh, and a belief that we are in this together. And uh, when I was three years old, I was adopted, uh, and I was brought into a, a new family that invested in peace as well. In fact, uh, my great-grandparents created a center, uh, the Phillips Center for Multi-Faith Learning uh, at St. John's University in Minnesota, because as a Jewish family, we have always empathized with oppression, with the lack of self-determination, and frankly, uh, with the lack of safety and security that both the Muslim and the Jewish communities have faced for, for centuries. Uh, so many of us now living in the United States because of that very persecution that thankfully brought us here. So I want to give you that background because I want everybody to know uh, that my mission is peace. My mission is to ensure the safety and security of Israel and Israelis and the safety and security of Palestinians and the recognition of Palestine. Uh, I intend to be a president who is Jewish, who recognizes Palestine who creates a 21st century Marshall Plan uh, that will invest in self-determination and safety and security and possibility, not just at the government level, but with uh, the business community joining in to provide opportunity. I know we're all human beings. 
when you have nothing to protect, when you have no hope, you have no future, uh, what life is ahead of you. And that's why that is true, whether it is in Gary, Indiana, here in the U.S., or in Gaza. And I know that. I, I hope you all know and recognize why I have deep affection for Israel and why I feel a personal responsibility uh, to help protect it, ensure its stability, its safety, and its security. And I think what we're facing, Salam, I think you would agree, is we're facing extremism uh, on both sides. This is not a singular narrative. Uh, Hamas is extreme, uh, using tactics that I think are horribly destructive. Benjamin Netanyahu, extreme, his government, not one that I believe is in pursuit of peace and can be the deal makers that we need. In fact, I've been saying this now through my whole campaign, Salam, we need new leadership from the West Bank to the West Wing. And my proposition is not one of condemnation, it's one of invitation. I wish to work with Americans first to consolidate humanity above all else, and then work with new generations of leaders all around the world, uh, not just here in, uh, in Palestine and Israel, but my hope is that throughout the entire Muslim world, as you noted, um, a massive amount of oppression still, a lack of self-determination, a lack of freedom and prosperity and possibility, and we're all joined by that singular desire to be safe and have a future. And I want to focus on that. And I would ask that perhaps we take this very terrifying, painful moment for uh, both communities and turn that into something remarkable, a uh, legacy perhaps. Uh, but that can only start by doing what we're doing right now, which I'm so grateful for, the opportunity to get to know each other, build some trust, and then take that to the next level, which is the uh, the, the nature of peace, the olive branch of the future, if you will. And that's indeed why I'm presenting my name as an alternative uh, to Mr. Biden, who I do believe represents a worldview, a mindset uh, of the past. And I'm a believer in diplomacy. Uh, of course, I know we all sadly need strong militaries, but if we do not lead with peace, if we do not lead with diplomacy, uh, if we do not lead with support and possibility, I do not know how we could ever think that we will find the solution. So that's my invitation. Uh, I started by listening. I, I share my perspective. I do wish to uh, facilitate, encourage, and foster uh, a state of Palestine. I hope it is a democratic Palestine in which Palestinians can determine their future, uh, their laws, uh, their, their possibilities. But it doesn't end there. I hope we can extend that uh, to Muslim populations around the world. And I know that is actually at odds with many of the people with whom we must work to achieve the very peace and security and prosperity uh, that we aspire to for Palestinians. So that's where I come from. Uh, I do not claim to be one that can wave a magic wand and make it happen. I do claim to be one who comes to you with an open heart and an outstretched hand to work together. Uh, it has to start somewhere with someone. And if not now, when? And if not, not, if not us, who? That is my invitation. And may this be a beginning. I'd like to think that this cycle we've just, not, it's not over yet, sadly. I hope it ends immediately. And once it does, may this be the last cycle of bloodshed and violence, that no more Palestinian lives be lost and no more Israelis be lost either. That's what I want. Uh, I, I, I will end with this. I wish to preserve, protect, enhance uh, and cherish uh, a bright Palestinian future. I also wish to protect, enhance, and cherish a bright future for Israel. If we can agree on those two things, I do believe anything is possible. And if nothing else, I believe it actually might be the very beginning of more peace around the world at a time where we surely need it. So thank you. Thank you. You, you are definitely uh, a breath of uh, fresh air. Congressman, I really appreciate your words. I don't think many people have heard words like that from any uh, presidential candidate uh, that is sitting in the U.S. Congress today. Uh, so we really appreciate that. Uh, you have a friend in Rashida Tlaib. She was censored by the Congress. Uh, tell us <clears throat> why, why that happened. Uh, why can't the U.S. Congress except a Palestinian narrative. At least that's the perception. From well, mm -hmm. Look, I, as, as I shared earlier, first of all, I want you to know that uh, I, when, when Representative Omar was removed from the Foreign Affairs Committee, I defended her on the House floor. 
when the attempt was made against uh, Representative Tlaib, uh, I defended her publicly as well, because we do not always have to agree. In fact, let, let, let's talk about my friend Rashida. You know, we could not come from more different backgrounds. Of course, she of Palestinian descent, her grandmother still lives, I believe, in the West Bank. You know, I of Jewish descent. You know, the, the sadness uh, that has uh, afflicted our respective populations for generations uh, is real. And I know I've never walked in her shoes. Uh, I've never felt her pain. And I'm sure all of you can empathize with the fact that uh, that is mutual. But I feel so strongly that if we shut down voices, uh, if we limit conversation, even if it's painful for any of us, we're doing the, a disservice to, to Allah, to, to God, to Hashem, because that is antithetical uh, to, I believe, why human beings exist in the first place, which is to celebrate difference, uh, to break bread, uh, find common ground, and uh, move forward in a spirit of peace. That's what I do with my friend Rashida. It's not easy for her. It's not easy for me. It develops uh, a spirit of condemnation uh, from those on, frankly, both sides. And that's why I think that courage to convene, the courage to convene at a time when so many wish us not to, is why we need to invite more of us to do that. And I do believe if we can do that here in the United States, bring the Jewish community together with the Muslim community of all backgrounds and, and nations, uh, imagine what that says to the world about America. Because if it cannot start, start here, how in the world can we achieve that anywhere uh, else? And those relationships are very important ones. Uh, they're mutual. They're difficult sometimes. But that's not a bad thing. But we have to maintain those and nurture those, water those seeds, so that we can collect that fruit uh, as our legacy. Uh, again, very heartwarming and refreshing words to hear from you, Congressman. And I also believe that if we can get over the conflict in the Middle East and build bridges between the United States and the Muslim world using American Muslims as ambassadors to the Muslim world and reconcile a lot of these issues, uh, not just in Israel, Palestine, but throughout the Middle East, South Asia, um, uh, in Iran, North Africa, yes. then there can be an amazing partnership between the United States and the Muslim world mm -hmm. that can give us great economic prosperity, peace uh, throughout the world, um, and be that nobody would be able to challenge uh, this partnership. It would be taking America to the next level uh, as a superpower. So I cannot that's wait. Hope. So, um, that's, you, you, just, you just issued the words that we should all live by. And as we even approach this forthcoming election, you know, that is the ultimate question. Do we wish to continue to litigate the past with, frankly, with men of the past? Or do we consider to be bold and courageous and actually move to a future? It won't be easy. It won't be expeditious. But it will exist if we are ready to move there. And that's the choice we all have. And that's, uh, I think, what you just shared is, is quite powerful because it's not just about a singular issue. It's about something much bigger. And I think we have an opportunity, frankly, a new generation has maybe the last opportunity to actually realize it before we are at a point that it may be too late. It is not. And I want the same for my daughters as all that you and anybody watching this want for your own children, uh, which isn't just safety and security and prosperity, but it's mutual affection and celebration of differences and learning from one another. And as anybody you know, who has read the Quran and the Torah would know, uh, yes. the the common ground, uh, the common experience, the the common ethics and principles are remarkably aligned. And I want to express more of those and use that as the way to move forward. And my request and invitation is to anybody who might be interested in having me to listen, not to tell or to project or to insist, rather to listen. I will show up anywhere at any time in front of anyone. I run to the fire, not away from it. And I know everybody who might be inspired by uh, that uh, might be interested in doing so because we have way too many people in powerful positions who run away from the fire when we should be putting it out and planting new seeds. Um, let's turn to the domestic front now. Um, you, you have a strong economic plan Tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are, what your aspirations are in terms of uh, achieving um, 
you know, bridging the gap between the haves and have nots, which seems to get wider and wider uh, these days. Well, thank you. In fact, and when I look at our founding documents here in the United States, it's all are created equal. Uh, of course, all have not been treated equal. We all know that. Uh, that is certainly Jew uh, true of the Jewish community and the Muslim community and the Black community and the indigenous, indigenous community and so many. <clears throat> so my proposition is this. It's actually quite simple. Uh, and the question is this first. If everyone is created equal, how could we possibly explain the disparities between so many, the fact that Black families have so much less wealth than white families. It's a six to one ratio uh, for white families over black families. Uh, why are so many communities uh, disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis white families? Well, it's simple, at least for the black community, it's the long tail of slavery. We all know that, that's so evident. But also policies for generations have limited the ability to own, to, to, to climb the ladder of success and pursue that American dream. So my proposition is this, so long. Starting at birth, I want to introduce a plan called American Dream Accounts, in which the federal government will endow an investment account for every baby born in this country uh, at $1,000. And that $1,000 will begin their lives. Every year, up to $500 can be added to it. Our, our children will learn about investing and entrepreneurship in public school as they track their investment growing. And then as an incentive to graduate high school, that money, once it fully vests, it'd be about $20,000 at 6% a year. $20,000 would be afforded to every person when they graduate high school. So they can become owners of this economy, uh, buy a house, a down payment on a house perhaps, uh, start a small business, uh, pay for their, their joys, their hobbies, their pursuits. And that's how life should begin. I believe in paid family leave and childcare for, to make sure everyone has childcare. I want K pre-K through college education at no tuition. So nobody is burdened with debt, which is, I think, obscene for a country that values self-sufficiency uh, and the like. Uh, from, uh, from there, I wish to ensure that everybody has health care. I believe in a national health insurance system so that 25 million people who have none right now will be covered, that 90 million who are underinsured will have better insurance, and that we no longer be a country in which two thirds of all personal bankruptcies are because of medical debt. I believe it is a foundational principle that healthcare should be available to all, that the country should cover the, the payment of it, but the provision of the care should remain in the private sector. Uh, I also believe in housing has to be built. Seven million houses have to be built, homes in America, because we have half a million people living outside in the streets. And we need to reduce the cost of housing by producing more and we can, we can do so. Uh, I also believe at the retirement age, when you have worked hard and contributed to this economy, uh, that we should protect you. Uh, we should make social security more robust, never cut it. And I wanna do something quite simple and remarkable, create a philanthropic pool by which any American who does not need their social security can electively contribute it and then have it redistributed to the lowest 10% of retirees who are deeply struggling, especially as we see rising costs and prices. Uh, that is my proposition. Uh, I also wish to test uh, pilot programs for basic income in the lowest income census tracts in our country so that people can become self-sufficient, not be denied that opportunity. And I think we have to start paying attention to what is coming down in the future, artificial intelligence, disruptions to this economy that we can anticipate but we have to prepare for it to ensure that everybody can succeed. And by doing so, we will raise the foundation for all Americans, but particularly for communities that have not had the same chances. And back to my story, it should not take a stroke of good luck or being born in the right zip code that determines where you end up in the United States of America. And I think that should be the beacon for the world. I think if we can do that and demonstrate our principles, we can then share them and inspire them all around the world. And that is my mission, that's my mandate. And that is indeed why I'm running for president. It is a long shot, it is a tough hill to climb, but my goodness, if we actually join hands and unify behind that plan and that prospect, anything is possible, Salam. Well, uh, the, these are amazing incentives and initiatives um, and, and quite aspirational. And what I hear you saying is that unless we um, we support and foster uh, and 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 fortify the middle class, mm -hmm. and democracy will erode. Uh, 
we will it lose is. our democracy. It's uh, happening right in front of our eyes, Salam. Yeah. You know, you see right behind me, we must relieve, we must repair, and we must reimagine. And this is our time. And if we do not make those investments, you're absolutely right. We cannot be a country in which 60% live paycheck to paycheck, 40% can't afford a $400 emergency, uh, in a country in which about a third of all the wealth, about 30 some trillion dollars, is in the hand of just the 1%, when the bottom 50%, uh, half of this country only has two and a half percent of that total wealth. Uh, we can't exist like that. Uh, that's why it's time for compassionate capitalism. Uh, I wish to inspire it. I have a business background. I have a nonprofit background. And I now have a public sector background that I wish to combine and uh, offer this country as a new way forward, a new generation, and most of all, a new spirit. Uh, I also wanted to tell you I'm going to do something different in the White House. I'm going to have something called Common Ground Dinners where everyday Americans, you know, Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, probably atheists, will come to the White House, people of Republican backgrounds and Democratic backgrounds, blue states, red states, to come to the White House in a casual setting uh, to spend an evening with their president once a month, break bread, tell your stories, share your dreams, your concerns, and have the president, me, listen to you. That's the first time I think any president will have done something as simple as important and that demonstrates the very peacemaking foundation that I think we need to start from. And I, I can't wait. January 20th, 2025 is less than a year away. That's the inauguration. Uh, should that be me that day making that speech and then moving into the White House, that White House door will be opened to everybody. And that's how we will begin my presidency. And that's how we begin this journey. You are uh, about to uh, go to the New Hampshire primaries coming up. Uh, and uh, as we move towards the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, uh, it's also interesting that in 1968, Hubert Humphrey was the candidate, uh, and and that convention was probably one of the most historic convention. It, unfortunately, when when conventions make news, it's not for good things. Not a good thing usually. Yeah. Mayor Daley called. Uh, I, I forgot what he, he. I think he called the National Guard because of the yeah, protests exactly. outside the convention. Right. How do you see this conve convention in Chicago um, happening, what, 50, 56 years later, uh, but kind of the same conditions? So I'm going to, of course, there's an obvious analogy here, but let, let me take you back to Hubert Humphrey and another Democratic uh, um, convention that I think is underappreciated, and that's 1948, in which a young Hubert, Hubert Humphrey uh, knowingly about to issue a speech that he thought might ruin his career, had the audacity to appear in front of the Democratic National Committee in the convention in Philadelphia and uttered the words, it is time for the Democratic Party to get out of the shadow of states' rights and into the bright sunshine of human rights. Mm. And with that singular message, at that time, a third of the attendees walked out of the arena, led by Strom Thurmond, the Dixiecrats, they were offended by the notion that Democrats could stand for human rights, for civil rights. And young Hubert Humphrey, uh, in whose shoes I now walk, inspired that and created, I think, the very beginnings of a movement that would ultimately become the civil rights movement in America. Uh, I'd like to think that this next convention can be more analogous to that, uh, to reform the Democratic Party, to recognize its responsibilities, and also create a new generation, a new path forward, and recognize that we have not been fulfilling the promises that so many fought for for so long. So I would like to avoid a catastrophe like 1968, rather use my disruptive candidacy to do just the opposite, to bring us together. And that takes unity in a way that we've never done before. Uh, that takes communities joining together to send a message to the Democratic National Committee that would like right now to coronate a single candidate, that's Joe Biden, and to silence others, uh, to resist the notion of a competition by taking candidates off ballots, as they're doing to me and Marianne Williamson, and also to suppress debate, to not agree to a single debate during our Democratic primary season. So as I look to the convention in Chicago, I actually do so with optimism that this might be that opportunity uh, to elevate and restore and recommit uh, to the principles that I think have really gotten lost and need to be um, re-elevated, reintroduced, and like I said, reimagined. Well, Congressman, uh, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. You're a voice of courage and conscience. Um, we we need more 
leaders like you. I really appreciate the opportunity to at least bring you forward to the Muslim community, and and uh, we wish you well. And um, I also uh, believe that Islamic values and American values are one and the same. Here, and here. Islam can be part of American pluralism. That. America is home to Islam. Islam is finding a new home in this world that can be expressed in the freedom and um, in, in restorative, restorative justice that all of our religions call for. So here, here. really, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Salam. You, you have inspired my day and brought a smile to my face and warmed my heart because I want to express my love uh, for the Muslim community. Uh, I want to express my understanding of the rage and the pain right now. I acknowledge it. I understand it. I want this bloodshed to end as quickly as humanly possible and never allow it to happen again. And I just don't believe that investing in people of the past is the way to do so. So thank you uh, for affording me a moment to listen and learn and understand and to introduce myself and to anybody who wants to do so more. Uh, I am here. I'm available. I accept invitations. And my goodness, I cannot wait to extend them to all of you. So Godspeed, much love, and heartfelt gratitude. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you.